Welcome gaming enthusiasts, this is Jesus from Jesus Gaming and Podcast, and today's episode, we delve into a tale that has shaped the landscape of virtual football and the game industry at large. Join me as we explore the beginning and the end of the iconic partnership between Electronic Arts and the FIFA organization. And before we kick off, make sure you hit that like button and ring the notification bell to stay updated on all things gaming from Jesus Gaming and Podcast. With this, let's get started. It all began in the late 90s when Electronic Arts, a gaming powerhouse already, and FIFA, the International Football Association, joined forces. The partnership birthed a game franchise that would soon become a global phenomenon. The EA Sport FIFA, the video game series, brought the excitement of footballs to millions of homes worldwide, whether you were a fan or not of football or soccer. From pixelated players to lifelike animations to the journey was exhilarating. Most notably, the debut game was the EA Sport FIFA 94, originally named as FIFA International Soccer, the very same game that was based on the United States terms of being the host country for the real-life FIFA season back in 1994. It was released on December 15, 1993, landing on the Sega Genesis, the Commodore Amiga, Nintendo Game Boy, Sega Game Gear, Sega CD, Master System, Super Nintendo, and the 3DO and was described by gaming outlets as a great game to introduce people to soccer or football and also serves to introduce nowadays to gaming fans of the retro gaming as the game possesses technical powers, impressive at the time, and with the infamous gameplay mechanics of being able to run away from the referee when he's trying to book a player is still as bizarre and enjoyable today as it was when the game first hit the stores back in 1993. With this, we can cover what I would call the golden era of the Electronic Arts EA Sport FIFA relationship. As the years roll on, the partnership flourishes giving rise to what many consider the golden era of FIFA games. The graphics became more realistic and the gameplay more immersive, and the fan base expanded exponentially. The virtual stadium echoed with the shears of million mirroring the passion found in real-world football matches. Electronic Arts and FIFA seemed unbeatable, creating an inseparable bond between gamers and the FIFA franchise. To me, honestly, my fondest memory was with FIFA 98 or FIFA World Cup 98 for the PlayStation. Boy, I was blew out of my mind and I wasn't a soccer fan or nor a video game for football or soccer fan by then. But to see how the game was developed, and believe it or not, I felt impressed even in the quality on how the menu, the game menu, was structured and designed. World Cup 98 is a football video game that was released in 1998, obviously, as I said, to consider with the year's FIFA World Cup football tournament that was hosted by France, developed by EA Canada and published by Electronic Arts under the EA Sport label. It is the first official FIFA World Cup game developed by EA Sport after obtaining the rights from FIFA in 1997. And this description that I copied from Wikipedia uh, fails to mention that it's actually not the first game under the FIFA banner, but the first game that was centered a around a World Cup. Unlike the previous World Cup games, which were in 2D and showed a bird eyes view, World Cup 98 used a 3D engine utilizing DirectX for the PC version particularly. Accurate national team kits, except for the goalkeepers who were used as generic kit, were introduced completely with kit manufacturing logos and official merchandise. The game engine is based on what FIFA wrote to World Cup 98, though it features some minor gameplay improvements to areas such as in-game strategy changing and players positioning. The playable team in the friendly mode also includes several nations that did not qualify for the finals. World Cup 98 was released for Microsoft Windows, PlayStation, and Nintendo 64. A version developed by Tearstead Design Studio and published by THQ was also released for the Game Boy. The intro song to the game is Shumbawamba's Dum Dumping. Unfortunately, I can't play back the song because the algorithm and platform willingness to comply to the DMCA police or Digital Millennium Copyright Police. And no, we don't want that, of course. But returning to the topic, critics praise the game as one of that delivers a fast reaction to controller's commands, realistic player movement, clean graphics, an excellent soundtrack and adrenaline pumping excitement, and specifically for PC gamers, 
the game is on par on performance with console versions, specifically the PlayStation version. As I said earlier, this game proved that casual sport fans and non-soccer fans can equally enjoy the game. Unfortunately, it wasn't a free ride of success and everything good. There were also some controversies. And, of course, we can't have a full story without these challenges. The Electronic Arts and FIFA partnership faces first of share of controversy, from in-game purchases to concern about players' likeness, the relationship between the gaming giant and the football association faced scrutiny. Fans demand the change, and the game industry began to evolve. But how did this controversy impact the relationship? Well, in reality, Electronic Arts controversy and criticism can have one podcast episode or a sole video in the future, but I want to focus on what happened while having the FIFA partnership. Electronic Arts was called out for its monetization practices, especially the loot boxes saga of the late 2010s in many gaming markets. A uh, recap for those who doesn't know, a loot box is a type of microtransaction in the video games in which players can use in-game rewards or real-world funding or real money to gain a virtual box filled with in-game items, the effect of which can vary. One approach used when created loot boxes is to limit the system to only provide items that do not alter the gameplay, such as a visual customization option for characters, or sometimes called cosmetic items. In contrast, another approach sees loot boxes dispense items that do alter gameplay. The latter style has drawn criticism from gamers and the wider public because many companies fail to not limit this as a pay-to-win method. It was by 2017 that Electronic Arts decided to have loot boxes in many of their games, including EA Sport and EA Sport FIFA. Of course, that wasn't the obsession and started officially with FIFA 18 within the FIFA Ultimate Team mode. I want to add that FIFA was not the only game that debuted loot boxes that year, but also Mass Effect Andromeda and Star Wars Battlefront 2. In the case of Star Wars Battlefront 2, Electronic Source initial approach to loot boxes during the Battlefront 2 open beta period involved pay to win elements, with boxes containing powerful unlockable characters that otherwise would require hours of play to acquire them through in game funds, in game boots that were only available through loot boxes, by the way, and other effects. Which players, of course, didn't appreciate that, leading Electronic Arts to change what the Battlefront 2 loot boxes contained, including ensuring all items could otherwise be earned through in-game means. The situation and failing at damaging control, Electronic Arts was ultimately warned by Disney, who currently owns the Lucasfilm and all the Star Wars intellectual property, that the game loot boxes needed to be deactivated until they could devise a non-pay-to-win system Fearing the loot box system could be seen as encouraging players, including children, into gambling indirectly. And that warning has to be understood about the next loot boxes war scenario with FIFA, which was the basis on the United Kingdom series of the late 2010s, where electronic arts were called out valiantly to make loot boxes to be accessible to minors and children and having them participating in gambling, as I said earlier. Electronic Arts contested the ruling, including elsewhere in the world like Belgium and the Netherlands, asserting that the FIFA system was not in, in violation of gambling regulation, but eventually, by January 2019, disabled the, the ability for Belgian players to purchase loot boxes in FIFA games to bring the game into compliance. In the United Kingdom, Electronic Arts defended its use of loot boxes, comparing them to surprise mechanic, akin to a collectible toys found in Kinder Surprise Act. Do you consider loot boxes to be a, an, an ethical feature of your games? Kerry? Well, first, we don't call them loot boxes. I think that was... Whatever a, term but, but, you wish to apply yeah, to them, so, do so, you consider them ethical? So what we look at as, as surprise mechanics. Um, right. But I think it's important to look at this. So uh, if, yeah. if, you go to, if you go to a... Uh, I don't know what your version of Target is, but as a store that sells a lot of toys, and you do a search for surprise toys, what you'll find is that this is something people enjoy. They enjoy surprises. And so it's, it's something that's been part of toys for years, whether it's Kinder Eggs or Hatchimals or LOL Surprise. Um, we do think the way that we have implemented these kind of mechanics, and, and FIFA, of course, is our big one, our FIFA Ultimate Team and our packs, is actually quite ethical and quite fun, enjoyable to people. 
Um, we agree with the UK Gambling Commission, the Australian Gambling Commission, and many other gambling commissions that they aren't gambling. And we also disagree that there's evidence that shows it leads to gambling. Instead, we think it's like many other products that people enjoy in a very healthy way uh, and like the element of surprise. Okay, so just to be absolutely clear, <laughs> your loot boxes or surprise mechanics, you have no ethical qualms whatsoever with. Uh, so I, I think you're recharacterizing my language. What I said is I think the way we've implemented our FIFA Ultimate Team Packs is ethical. Okay, other than FIFA and, and other games that you provide, do you have, are you, are you equally comfortable and relaxed? For, For all of the games we have on the market that have a randomized content mechanic, a surprise mechanic, a loot box, um, I, I have no qualms that they are implemented in an... Un a statement criticized by the gaming press as downplaying the loot boxes issue. Uh, this is another topic for another whole video, maybe podcast episode, but it was that at the end of the classical electronic art era where monetization was the high priority and there was some high level of executives that actually planned to extend the stretch of monetization, including Battlefield having gamers to actually buy reloads or bullets magazine for their weapons. So that ridiculous uh, become the thing with loot boxes and the opportunities that electronic cars wanted to have revenue out of gamers. And unfortunately, we got the breakdown as the year progresses, so did the gaming landscape. New players entered the fields, offering innovative approach to virtual football or soccer. Electronic Arts faced increased competition, and FIFA began reevaluating its gaming partnership. The once unbreakable bond between the two giants started to weaken. Join me as we dissect the events that led to the breakdown of this historic collaboration and the emergence of a new era of virtual football soccer gaming. While the partnership may have come to an end, the legacy of Electronic Arts and FIFA lives on. The impact of their collaboration has left an indelible mark in the gaming industry, but in the end, what did happen? Well, for 30 years, Electronic Arts, under the EA Sport brand, had the privilege to be the exclusive provider of video games for the simulation aspect of everything related to the FIFA Soccer League, but now there are different times and nothing lasts forever. And what I mean the simulation aspect is that Electronic Arts was by then the only company allowed to make video games that copied the exact statistic, uh, current status of teams, players, the whole teams and stadiums or whatever it was happening in the real life of the soccer football industry or sport. Since quite a long time ago, it was been rumored that Electronic Arts and FIFA were at odds to the point that it was just a matter of time of either FIFA or Electronic Arts chanting that this is it regarding the eSport FIFA video game series will come to an end. And that day was actually confirmed two years ago when Electronic Arts and FIFA pre-ordered the launch of EA Sport FIFA 23, announced that the partnership would have ended after the game's marketed season, and EA Sport will no longer have the exclusivity to make games with simulation of real-life teams and players. Defied the fact, Electronic Arts rebranded its main soccer game as EA Sport FC, and while this means that FIFA and probably some direct sponsorship will not be more beginning since 2023 with the launch of what we know as EA Sport FC, as I mentioned. Traditional options like Ultimate Team, Career, Pro Clubs, and Volta will all remain in the game. Also, Electronic Arts managed to do some homework and still have partnership with Premier, La Liga, Bundesliga, and all the pl uh, players, teams, and stadio relating to that partnership. It has been known that both EA and FIFA were at odds, as I mentioned, and but mainly in 2022, negotiation for a renewal fell through because since the beginning of the 2020s decade, FIFA wanted more control on external branding sponsorship, probably filtering Electronic Arts' approach to sponsorship, something that for years they have been kind of uh, managing themselves. And my take is the, they also wanted to prevent any more scandals like the loot boxes a few years earlier. All this with a $1 billion fee, and of course, Electronic Arts considered the amount high. But either way, Electronic Arts made a counteroffer to FIFA, 
Their offering was expanding the partnership to work opportunities, allowing Electronic Arts to manage new things along with FIFA. And I think that mentioning the thing called NFT or non-fungible, or I forgot what the NFT means, but it has to do with cryptocurrency, and conceded on doing less liberty to do external business. The announcement obviously signaled that there wasn't a possibility to make an agreement time or make an agreement on time to renew the partnership. So what about life after FIFA? Well, as I mentioned, it, EA Sport FC 24 and the FC series is what the Phoenix Bird researched from the ashes in the side of electronics and EA Sport. And the game promises to be a rebuild from scratch with a new version of Electronics Art own game engine Frostbite and includes a new version of the technology called Hypermotion V, which the company says makes it possible to create new animation for the games in a matter of days. There's also a new technology called Playstyles, which utilizes real-world player data to create more like, uh, more lifelike rea recreation of actual players, including gameplays and celebration for each goal. Answering the FIFA-less aspect of the game, Electronics are already confirmed that the game will include content via partnership with Premier League, UEFA Champions League, and already landed a big sponsorship on real-life games of respective leagues. Also, includes the UEFA Women's Champion League, UEFA Europa League, UEFA Europa Conference League, the UEFA Super Cup, and the Google Pixel from both the Liga and Liga F, or Liga F to say it in Spanish. The game will also have a mobile counterpart called FC Tactical, which is described as a turn-based take on the sport. Electronic Arts also confirmed that women will feature in FIFA Ultimate Team for the first time in the franchise history. Pro Close Mode will feature crossplay for the first time in the franchise history, too. The consensus within the reviews is that EA Sport made a good job on having the game not losing its quality despite being unable to plant the FIFA name and logo. And also, it is notable the absence of anything related to FIFA as the game being unable to accept and complete simulation of leagues and teams that are not under the current FC license makes the game unable to avoid having a more balanced than real life teams and statistics. But it still remains to see that a non-FIFA factor is a determining factor and probably, in my opinion, it will take a few more launches, meaning that a few years with FC25 and FC26, we can see if Electronic Arts and EA Sport can carry out without a 30-plus year corner partnership. I don't doubt that Electronic Arts haven't been prepared for one day that they can really have to say that they are currently partnered with FIFA. What I do believe is that maybe FIFA wasn't expecting to this happening in just the 2020s decade and maybe much of their approach actually was the, the catalytic of the partnership between Electronic Arts and FIFA to have ended. And there you have it, the captivating journey of Electronic Arts and FIFA from the accelerated beginning to an unexpected end. Uh, let me know in the comments, what are your thoughts on this Connie partnership? Do you agree on the reasons of FIFA just didn't want to ink a new renewal for the partnership with Electronic Arts? Was Electronic Arts really dropped the ball on this one? And also, don't forget to like this video if you're enjoying this content via YouTube podcast. And if you're listening to Spotify and the Anchor Networks of Podcasting, please give a follow on all the main podcasting network. Until next time, this is Jesus from Jesus Gaming and Podcast signing on and game on. Health and success, everyone.